very much. Thank you all for being here. Um, good afternoon. Welcome to your Innovation, Technology, and General Services Committee. I'm joined by my uh, council colleague, Council Member O'Farrell, uh, and we assume uh, Council Member Bonin will be joining us shortly. Uh, before we get started, Mr. Villanueva, are there any general public comment cards? We don't have any. No sorry. comment cards. Okay, great. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, recommend that items 6 and 7, they're both having to do with obsolete records, be done on consent. No objection. Okay, no objection. So that is uh, the order without objection. Yes, sir. Can, can I read it to the record, sir? Please. Thank you. Items number six and seven are city attorney reports relative to the request to destroy certain obsolete records from the Los Angeles Department of Transportation, various divisions for the period of January 1st, 1954 through December 31, 2011. Great. So without objection, uh, that's the order. Mr. Billion, we, we took all the technology out of your district and we moved it to the other districts without objection. Uh, uh, did you take the traffic as well? No, we left, left the traffic. That's the only item I objected to. <laughs> okay, so uh, item six and seven have been approved on consent and we will move forward to uh, item number one. And uh, would you please read item one into the, into the record? Yes, sir. Item number one is a verbal report from the general manager of the Information Technology Agency relative to the top ten department priorities. And are there any cards on this item? We don't have any cards on this item. No sir. cards. Great. So we have with us uh, Mr. Renneker, the general manager of ITA. Uh, if you would, uh, as you have on, on many occasions, go through and, and on, as, as you go through each one, we may have a question or two, and then we can always ask additional at the end. So please go Very ahead. good. Good afternoon. <clears throat> on the first item, on the 311 CRM upgrade, the, the project, as you might have recalled, was yellow last month. Uh, we have done some catch-up. It's now in a green line condition. It's on time. Uh, the MyLA311 will leverage the LADWP user account access capability so that when people need to either access their LADWP bill, uh, they'll also be able to see all their submissions to MyLA311. So we've worked through those issues. All the equipment's been ordered. Uh, the project spoke, uh, scope has been identified. And I think Councilman Bonney, you'd mentioned the last one, you said that City Council Office has been involved in, in, the, in the process. And, and certainly Councilman Blumenfield's office attends the meetings. The rest of you are invited to those. The other council offices is part of phase two. So the intent is after May, we will have an inclusion on how we include the design and scope for anything unique for them. And there's also two remaining departments that will be part of the phase two, which will be a budget submission later this fall. And on this item, we continue every, every time something comes up to ask the other departments, are they coordinating with, with you and with the 311 system? And have you been finding that, that you've been getting that kind of coordination from the other departments so that it's all? It's been very good coordination and collaboration between all the departments, and the project's going well. Wonderful. Okay. Can I ask a question about the, yeah, please. Uh, the DWP thing triggered something in, in, in my head that I was talking about the other day. Um, uh, on my cell phone, I can go to my AT&T account and I can see how many of my minutes I've used for that month, how many of my rollover minutes are, are there. What's the potential of, of, of getting to a, a, a place where, we, where a, a DWP customer could see online, either through the 311 app or the DWP account, how much water or electricity they're using that month? If people saw in real time, it might help them use less. Um, I don't have, I'll, I'll consult with LADWP on that. I know they have usage information in their new CIS application. I'm not sure what their strategy is as far as making that available via the mobile device, but I'll check and get back to you on that. Thanks. And I, and I know they, they were looking at these smart meters that allowed you to do that yeah. um, and see in real time in your house. So I would imagine you, at the minimum you'd need to have one of those before right. you can push that off into the mobile app. But that's a great idea. I'd love to see that. Implemented. Yeah. On priority number two, the uh, RFP for the city's email, desktop, and uh, enterprise standards. Uh, we have gotten four responses. Uh, we have uh, an evaluation team that includes Greg Allison from the city clerk, Kurt Sato from Fire, Maggie Goodrich from LAPD, Heather Janur from the ITA, Peter Marks, the mayor's office and Giovanni uh, Dacmas from uh, Billing and Safety are part of the process that will consider and elevate two finalists in, in August 
time frame. Uh, we hope to have the final scoring done by the end of July and then have vendor demos started in August time frame. So hopefully by September we'll have recommendations uh, for a potential vendor. And, and as part of that process, do they, they consider the, is it all considered as a new item or do they consider the, 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 the cost of migrating systems? Yeah, there will be the cost of not only migration, cost of training, um, and cost of anything net new, um, and also taking into account whatever existing licensing has already been purchased and getting credit for those items as, as part of the project as well. Okay. 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 Right. Next item. Mm -hmm. On the citywide broadband RP, or LACBN, uh, we have gotten 93 questions on the R5 that uh, were responded back to on May the 30th. We still have Best Best and Krieger and our city attorney uh, reviewing all the responses to the questions. We hope to post those very soon. They'll be posted both to uh, the LA Bavin site as well as to the LACBN uh, webpage. So you'll be able to see the responses to those questions in both areas. Uh, we, as a result of the original RFI responses being due next Monday, we've extended that per your direction uh, only through July the 18th. So that'll be the drop dead date for all the RFI requests and back. We've posted that on BAVID on the website and we've also used our Twitter at LACBN to notify folks of the, the extension. And we've had interest from two other firms that um, didn't have time to submit by the end of the month and will now um, respond by the 18th of July. So that'll be good. And in, in as much as you can speak to it appropriately, uh, do the RFI questions give you a good sense of optimism that we're going to get decent proposals in the RFP, or is it hard to, to judge one from the other? It's hard to judge because I think based on the RFI responses, we're actually going to build a model to maximize the number of responses from the RFP. So I think the real structure of the RFP is to be determined after we go through and review them. And I'm sure we'll be coming back here with a presentation on different business models or options to include and build the RFP around. And have most of the questions been about the, the, the broadband side, the Wi-Fi side, or, or really every element? I think the biggest issue has been with the city's permitting process mm -hmm. and the ability for them to be able to get through uh, that process and be able to build out whatever they intend to build out in a five-year period. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Questions on that item? Okay. Uh, next. Thank you. On the uh, LAFD dispatch uh, GPS project, uh, we have uh, an active team of people working with LA Fire uh, to update 600 mobile data computers. There's a new component on there uh, to help manage the quality control of the GPS called Whammy. Uh, that's being installed in all the products so that they can triage and troubleshoot if there's any problems with the GPS signal from a fire truck not, be, um, not working correctly. Adashi is the software vendor. Uh, they're in the testing phase of the implementation. Uh, we also have dispatch going through and testing that as well, and everything's on track for it to go live by uh, end of July. We also have been asked about turn-by-turn -turn directions. Um, those are in scope for a phase two. A phase two is due out in March of next year. Uh, the turn-by-turns will only work on the new mobile data computers, so there's a total of 600. Uh, approximately 400 are new, so there's still 200 uh, old mobile data computers that won't be able to do turn by turn. So that's something clearly to uh, be aware of in next year's budget process to take care of those so that they're all working uh, uh, properly. Uh, there was a, a question regarding incident data and traffic flows and taking into consideration anything else that might help route a vehicle closer to scene. Uh, we're in discussions with the vendor on that. Uh, they're considering it out of scope. We all know we have mobile devices where you can get that information online. The problem is, is how accurate is that information and how often is it updated, especially for real-time response needs of fire. So those items are still in discussion. We're trying to determine how we can get APIs from those feeds potentially into the future uh, to the technology that's in the fire vehicle so they can have line of sight to uh, road closures, uh, real-time traffic incidents that uh, may impede their way of getting to an incident. What, as it stands now, what 
data would they have in there to give traffic instructions? Is it just sort of baseline Google Map kind of stuff? This is the, the logical way you would go under optimum circumstances? That's correct. Okay. That's not all that hot. I mean, I, I've, d despite Google being in my district, I've stopped using Google Maps. I'm ways all the way because it gives me real-time stuff. Um, Google bought ways. Uh, oh, well, <laughs> very good. Good. So I'm not going against my district. I like that. Uh, Waze is, is, is certainly much more reliable. What, I'm curious, we, we, I think it would be much better to have real-time stuff in there. I mean, there's real-time stuff uh, 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 available from different places besides Waze, but what do we have uh, that would be in the system currently um, that shows where our construction projects are like do we have any online data that's available that 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 says that right now PCH and Sentinella both have lanes closed because of construction projects I believe in dispatch they have known areas where there's road closures so the two areas we've got to work on is getting those real-time feeds from both DOT and other sources and determining whether it should be the Adashi software uh, via their mapping software that should have it or should it be in the actual computer-aided dispatch software as we combine fire and, and uh, police operations under the same so that both can leverage the same technology? So those discussions aren't fully figured out. We're aware of the requirements for it, and I think it still needs to be determined where it's best to spend the money and the levels of effort because we potentially might be able to benefit two jurisdictions rather than just one. Right. All right. I got, I got more on that, but we can talk separately, I guess. And, and I can see how it could get really complicated because even if the north traffic is, you know, completely stopped, you know, fire truck can just yep. cruise on into the south lane and, and, and go through or go down a one-way street and all that stuff, and right. none of these programs take into account, right. you know, Water, yeah. doing things that are highly illegal right. under <laughs> regular circumstances. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. My concern is more of a concern than a question. I just want to voice it, and that is how reliable are these real-time feeds from Bureau Street Services or Department of Transportation? Because sometimes we'll round a corner and there's a construction project and a street closed at 8 o'clock a.m. and we didn't get the notification ourselves. That's going to be a concern, I think, moving forward. Um, just that that information is going to be reliable and therefore worthy of being integrated with as much accuracy as possible. It's an inexact science right now. Plus the fact that we're in, we are really essentially in and certainly entering into a level of development and new construction unprecedented in the city's history in major parts of the city. And, and I think that'll be a long-term, God willing, because it's great for the economy, but a, a long-term challenge that we have before us. So we, I hope that we can start um, pushing and prodding for more accurate uh, notifications from those two departments anyway, and certainly uh, water and power as well. Uh, so it's just a concern I wanted to put out there. It, it is a good one because certainly we can control what gets reported into Department of Transportation and then certainly update it once it's been cleaned up, mm -hmm. a potential traffic incident. We also have in Bureau of Engineering a right-of-way system where they have all the planned construction projects that are going in. So as long as we, the city, are diligent about uh, when it's reported and when it's cleaned up or when it's started and when it's completed, uh, we should be able to provide those feeds in. It's the other external uh, factors that come in, maybe from Caltrans on a SIG alert, right. only to find out the SIG alert was really cleaned up three hours ago, mm -hmm. maybe it wasn't updated. So we have to be careful, as you had indicated, what are our good feeds and maybe what are sources that aren't real good that you want to make real-time public well, safety decisions on. Throw in the special events that occur on weekends in various neighborhoods, and then you've, you've got a, a, even more of a cloudy picture. So that'll be something that we'll need to really get down and master. Very Thank you. Point. We'll be working on that. But whatever data points you have, it's going to be more than we have now on the paper map. That's right. Exactly. So. On the uh, RFP on number five for the voice over IP services, uh, we have elevated four vendors uh, for Ward. We actually are scheduling interviews for June 25th, 26th, and July 1st uh, to hear from all the vendors, mm -hmm. and we are looking forward to coming back with a recommendation hopefully towards middle to end of July for Ward of that. Right. Mm -hmm. 
On priority number six, the Avison Strategic Technology Services, uh, we had worked with Avison on a concept called Digital Enterprise, uh, which is a new tower for consideration. They're in the process of revising their report, and uh, they'll be looking forward to coming back here for some recommendations in the near future. The Digital Enterprise concept is one that we're incorporating into the ITA strategic plan, which we hope will be out here in the next few weeks. And some of those concepts are cloud first. Uh, some of the concepts around why do we have so many data centers in the city? Why are we doing so much application development? Shouldn't we be consider, uh, considered hosting a lot of our applications net new, like Build LA is an example, which is one of the first that we'll be considering that's net new. But we're actually, through the IT policy committee, inventorying all of the applications that we have in the city. And we're trying to ask questions about what departments are virtualizing them versus have their own standalone hardware. And the reason why that's important is you refresh your hardware every five to seven years. And when you refresh that hardware, should the question be asked, should we really spend money on that infrastructure, or is it less expensive to host it somewhere else? The other thing we're doing in the inventory is we're trying to get an idea of what's already hosted in the cloud and what is not. For example, we're going forward with a new content management system, all hosted in the cloud. Our Granicus uh, video feeds are hosted. So we're going to really have all the departments uh, ask the hard question of should we uh, need to consider going to a hosted solution rather than do it in-house? Is it less expensive? And as staff at TRID out, maybe it's more cost effective to consider those kinds of solutions. So that's really what's inclusive in, in this digital enterprise strategy coming forward and what Avisant's trying to do to articulate that vision to you as it goes forward. Great. Questions on that? <clears throat> on the uh, digital inclusion e-waste uh, pilot project, uh, Councilman Bloomfield, you, you did the presentation last week, uh, well received. Uh, we've got uh, a location uh, that General Services has uh, solidified for us. We've got over a thousand systems collected and a lot more is being collected from departments as we speak. We're still working on the permit to get all the access to the nonprofits and companies that will be doing the refurbishment there almost done. Uh, but it's been a very good collaborative effort, uh, including Bureau of Sanitation, ITA, and a lot of the business partners in the community that uh, are doing e-waste collection as well as PC refurbishment. On number eight, I won't go any details here. It's actually on the agenda for today. It's the uh, disaster recovery at SwitchNAP, so the contract is here for approval, so I'll let uh, Ted Ross go through that item. On number nine is the uh, an item that's been elevated here to the top ten. That is the uh, content management system. We have a kickoff meeting on July 1st. This includes all the departments. So there's two components of this. One is we're actually taking lacity.org, which now is hosted in the ITA data center, and it's now going to be hosted up into a cloud environment by a company called Acquia. And then we're going to be implementing some open source software that's very, very popular and the number one content management tool in the government marketplace, and that's called Drupal. All the departments will be trained in it, so that way they're going to be able to manage the content on their own web page so that we can keep content current. We're right now, a lot of the pages require calls into the ITA to change a phone number or a picture and things like that, and they'll be able to do that independently. And the, any questions on that? No. no. On, and the last item on here that we also elevated based on the timetable, the effort, it's been ongoing for some time. It's the uh, citywide performance-based budgeting system. All, all the software uh, license contracts have been executed with CGI. Um, and the uh, project's on schedule. It's expected to go live in November of this year. Uh, the test and production environments are being built in the ITA right now, and it'll be uh, all done in a virtualized environment, which means it's done very efficiently, not using a lot of hardware, but consolidated hardware. So we'll have the ability to do it under the contract, but actually choosing the metrics um, hasn't been done yet, right? I mean, that, that's that, correct. That, and that's, does that require... This may not be a question. You, council action to choose those metrics, or is that? I mean, when, when are you going to let the department just choose their metrics for starts, and then we we tweak those, or does it? Do you do you know what the process is for officially putting a metric into the uh, 
budgeting I system. I do not know officially. I can find out and get back to you. I know the CAO is working with the mayor's office, who's got GovStat, who's working with all the departments on their performance management units, where all the departments are responsible for providing metrics in. I'm not sure exactly which ones get put into the performance-based budgeting system or not, but I can find out for you. Yeah, no, I'd, li I'd like to do that. Something uh, I feel that the, the council should definitely have a role in that. Um, it's not so much an ITGS question as it's probably a budget committee question, but um, I'm on both committees and, and I uh, follow this issue closely and want to make sure that we, uh, that we have an appropriate uh, voice in those metrics. I'll let you know. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, no other questions on, on the top ten list? I have a quick curious question. How does one rank jump from 28 to 7 in one month? What we do is we go through, we focus on top 25. So we have a project portfolio management system that has the input for everything. We take a look at our resources. We take a look at those items that are high in priority but maybe don't have a contract vehicle, and they get pushed down until we get a contract vehicle, and then we elevate them again. Mm -hmm. So that's how we get to the top 10 is, is those where the majority of our resources are placed on it mm -hmm. and are available so we can report active progress. Very helpful. Thank you. Probably the uh, council office and the, I mean, having pushed that through and, yeah. and the council and the what and president, we have some influence over the, what goes on the top 10. And when we take up an item in full council, that's going to elevate it yeah. naturally to uh, make sense. The system. Great. Okay, thank you. So we'll move on to uh, item two, Mr. Villanueva. Would you, would you please read item number two? Yes, sir. Item number two is a CAO report relative to the proposed professional services agreement with Switch Communication Group, LLC, to establish an offsite disaster recovery facility. We do not have any speaker cards on this item, sir. Great. So we'll Jenny Yao with the CAO. Um, the item before the committee requests approval of a contract with Switch Communications Group for a five-year term with the option to extend up to an additional five years and total compensation not to exceed $5 million over the term of the contract to establish an off-site disaster recovery facility in Las Vegas for the city's five major financial management systems. Uh, funding for this contract is provided in the fiscal year 14-15 budget along with funds that will be reappropriated from the fiscal year 13-14 as approved by the council in the year-end financial status report. Uh, we recommend approval of the contract and for the general manager to extend the term for an additional five years if necessary. So long as all other terms and conditions remain the same, funds have been budgeted for this purpose and all other legal requirements are met. And I have Ted Ross here from ITA as well as Laura Ito from ITA. If there are any questions, we can answer. Great. Uh, start with a couple of questions. On the Do either of you have an opening presentation or, or just for questions? I, I can certainly, if you'd like a minute for additional background, I could certainly provide it. Uh, it started back in really 2012 in which ITA partnering with the controller's office, Office of Finance, General Services, as well as Emergency Management, was doing a review of the major five financial systems. So that's our financial management system, our payroll system, our purchasing system, uh, the LA tax tax revenue system, as well as Grand Central Disbursement, which sends out the bank files. These were identified as key applications that would certainly be necessary to have ready in case of major disaster or incident, emergency, etc. It's, it's some of many any major systems in the city of LA. And so the intent was to identify mechanisms for disaster recovery. Unfortunately, our current state, as described in the report, is these are primarily housed in the P4 data center in City Hall East. Data is backed up to tape and sent off site, but depending on the application, depending on the system, there are various and really quite limited mechanisms to bring these up should something happen to the P4 data center. And so there's possibilities of bringing it up in Van Nuys, possibilities of moving them to Garland. The reality is, in case of a regional disaster, a regional incident, for example, earthquake, it would likely not just impact City Hall East, but these other areas, these other locations. So certainly DWP was one of the first to make the move, and they established a site, and that's what's being recommended through here, this proposal, it is a site with Switch, which is a, a very prominent data center vendor uh, in Las Vegas, Nevada, and certainly Steve Renneker, when he came on board, our general manager, prioritized this as a top priority this last year, and so we've been working very diligently to identify our options, and this would seem to be an excellent option, not only because the Switch location is an excellent location 
location to establish the site and to establish our backup uh, uh, disaster recovery site, but also because it provides a rally point. So in the case of a disaster, we've got Department of Water and Power as well as ITA rallying to the same location in which we could assist each other and, and have a rally point to be able to bring the major systems back up. Um, and so there, you saw the additional items in there. The cost is about, um, make sure I get this right, the cost is, was at 200 and... 260, there you go. $260,000 with about a $50,000 setup. Uh, there's a lot more capabilities in having what we call a hot site model, which means that these would be active hardware in that location. So we would actually be able to fail over to that. So if some, we were running into a more limited outage, let's say in P4, we could actually run these systems from that location over there in Las Vegas. So it's more than just an insurance. Uh, it's something that actually could become a secondary data center for us. So we see a lot of potentials for return on investment with that approach. So I know there's a lot to say about, and I can get long-winded, but I certainly want to be open for questions. Okay. And I recently went down and visited the, the data center and, and saw firsthand that the, that we need to do something. Uh, we're literally carting tapes around. Uh, Correct. You know, old school style. Uh, and it creates multiple days of delay to get the tape to the location, to then load it, to then be able to try to get the system back up. And, and then we, if we did get the system back up, we're refreshing a system that's a week old. Correct. And, and which is better than not having a system at all, but everything that happened in that week is lost, and that, that could be millions and millions of dollars. Correct. Um, were there other operators considered for this? Absolutely. So we, we evaluate a variety of them, uh, but one thing that we saw is really a prime reason for utilizing SWITCH is the co-location with Department of Water and Power. So, for example, they are already hosting infrastructure there that would be beneficial between the both of us should there be a disaster. Once again, that rally point capability we found to be extremely important. To the extent that uh, Harbor, uh, 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 Los Angeles World Airports, and multiple other departments are evaluating and seeing IT progressing this path and, and have expressed some consideration and interest in potentially uh, joining us there at the same facility. And right now we're talking about five systems. Yes, and the five uh, major systems, you say, financial systems. Are, are there other systems that that we would want to prioritize for disaster recovery that would be, you know, do, do you have the list of six through ten if we ever got the funding? Or uh, we, we are absolutely in the process of prioritizing and evaluating other tier one systems. Uh, just the ITA alone supports over 100 applications. Uh, obviously, though, uh, having something ready day one, the course of emergency, not every application fits that bill. So we certainly know there's additional public safety applications in other areas that we're identifying to get those in. But, you know, being good city employees, we know that just getting our, our situation up and running, a tested application that we could fail over to is our prime priority and then start to expand that, that capability and bring in the other systems. And I, I would imagine that, but correct me if I'm wrong, that it, you know, when we did take on items 6 through 10 or through 20, that, that each one would, would be a lot cheaper uh, proportionally because we've already worked at the kinks, we've already gotten rid of some of the fixed costs and, and we're just adding a marginal, uh, you know, another rack or another, another whatever. Effectively building out on an existing platform, yes, which is much easier than establishing a whole new brand new platform. So, so, the, so the migration of all these other ones could actually happen a lot quicker and a lot easier Yes. once we get this, this going. Any other questions, colleagues? Just a quick question, Mr. Chair. Uh, take us through what the data center in Vegas will look like? Is it an existing center that houses other data centers for other cities? Is it in a remote nuclear-proof bunker somewhere? I mean, I'm, I'm just uh, I'm curious to see what the facility is like. Correct. One of the efforts we took, and, and it was, um, we actually did a tour of that location. It, so we did a day trip because we felt it was very important before we entered into the agreement, even though we certainly could take DWP's word for it in many ways. But we took a tour of it with Matt Lamp from Department of Water and Power, as well as uh, Peter Marks from the mayor's office, et cetera. And so it was, a, it was absolutely a, an impressive facility. Uh, impressive technically, impressive from a security perspective. So a little bit of the uh, of the uh, the imagery. So you enter into a facility. It's just outside of Las Vegas, and you are met by armed guards in Humvees. And so then they walk you in, and they have everyone submitting their IDs. Um, you're going through turnstiles, secured turnstiles. When you enter, they move you from location to location with armed guard behind. Um, they keep customer cages completely separate. So very, uh, very uh, environmentally efficient for the way they manage the data center, very secure. 
uh, even to the extent that they are granted special permissions from the state of Nevada to close it up and then the armed guards could effectively shoot on site and live off of that property for something like a year plus. I forget the exact number, but a very large amount of time they keep the, the food on site and the food there because it is not only used by organizations such as City of Los Angeles, but quite a few major organizations. So DreamWorks maintains a lot of their, their newest movies, movies that haven't been released yet out there. You've got Google, you've got Microsoft, you've got Intel, you've got Xerox, you've got Department of Defense, you've got eBay. Uh, eBay alone had a very massive set of racks that was storing their archives for, for eBay transactions. So it is a very prominent set of data centers managed by Switch, but at the same time very cost effective. And so we are far from their biggest customer. Fascinating. So it's not a strip mall with a slot machine. No, <laughs> it is definitely not. <laughs> I was waiting to see if it was in the basement of the Luxor or something. You know, yeah. a side visit might be worth yeah. it for a while. Yeah. Sounds like James Bond might be there. Absolutely. absolutely. And, and one of the reasons they chose Las Vegas is because when it comes to environmental impacts, it is one of the most friendly when it comes to disasters. So it's not an earthquake fault. It's not in a floodplain. So they chose that location specifically. It's very dry, and even though it's warm, they ran through all the different reasons to why you'd want to establish a data center there. And so that was one of the reasons why they ended up there. Wow. Thank you. Apocalypse starts there. So. I was going to say, you know, they have a lot of experience with that in Vegas. Any other questions on that item, colleagues? No. So then, uh, without objection, we'll move, move forward on that. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Uh, item number three, Mr. Villanueva. Item number three is an information technology agency report relative to the uplink facility for satellite carriage of LA City Butte 35. We do not have any card on this item, sir. Good afternoon. William Imperial from the ITA uh, Information Technology Agency with regard to uh, this report that was requested by LaBonge and Englander in establishing a satellite uplink facility to one of the satellite broadcasters. ITA has reported at least uh, four times on this since 1999 at the request of the council. What we found on each occasion and on this one is report notes. And I, I won't bore you with the details of the report because it is detailed out, we've done this before, I, I've done it myself three times, this is my fourth time around, that uh, it's just legally and financially infeasible. Legally, the satellite operators do not have a, an obligation to carry local pay, public ex educational and governmental access channels on their, on their uplink. Are, they are, by federal law, obligated to carry PBS, which is 4% of their programming, according to federal law. So they meet that obligation. That is the end of it for local carriage of uh, the PEG channels. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't some opportunities, and we detailed in this report and recommend, ITA recommends, that with the recent mergers that you've been hearing about between Time Warner Cable, Comcast, and Charter, which would not have an impact on this, but it has prompted AT&T and DirecTV to request a merger as well. They're seeking a merger. You have the opportunity as a council and through the mayor's office as well to seek as a condition of the approval of that merger that they carry at least channel 35. As of Monday, we're, we're very happy to announce to you right now that AT&T is now carrying a custom channel 35 that has three of the four peg city channels, city peg channels, I should say. We had a lawsuit going since 2009 that established this custom channel, and it's now on AT&T U-verse, channel 35, uh, UCTV, and our billboard channel. They are working on an agreement between AT&T and Time Warner Cable to carry channel 36, LACTAC, at this time, and we hope to have that up soon and on the custom channel. With that said, we have specifically pointed out in this report and the recommendations that if the council were to adopt a resolution conditioning or requesting of the federal government that a condition be added to the merger that they that AT&T and which which is already which is already carrying our custom peg channel add to the direct TV carriage because they're going to merge it's the same company channel at least channel 35 then through the resolution and a letter to by from the mayor's office um, to the FCC and possibly the Department of Justice who will review this it's possible that the Fair Trades Commission could also be involved in this merger request or review that um, that they condition that they accept the merger as part of that approval. And as part of that, another portion of, of that 
just not the letter request, is that city representatives or our lobbyists meet with the FCC and the Department of Justice or FTC, whoever's going to review this, with our resolution, with city council resolution and the mayor's uh, letter to add that as a, as a uh, condition. In addition, it wouldn't hurt, by the way, and also adding that too, is that we informally meet either with city representatives or through council leadership of the mayor's office that we meet with AT&T and uh, direct TV representatives to ask if they would informally agree to do that, to carry at least channel 35. And that's our recommended action. If you have any questions. Um. And then if, if they were to informally do it and then allow, it, allow us to include that as a condition of the, because I, I certainly like the idea that we try to ask for it to be a condition. Um, I'm skeptical that the feds will uh, put that in as a condition because they, it can't just be because we want it. They, there are certain legal reasons they would have to justify it. However, if they agreed to it voluntarily, they might be willing to write it into uh, the condition of the, of the merger, and they might have an interest in having us support that merger or at least not oppose the merger. So um, that's where it might come to, to, to play. I doubt, I doubt they're going to force it on their own but they would maybe write it in and memorialize an agreement. So I certainly recommend that we do that. Um, related to that, I know we've gone through this before, but technology has changed over the last four times that we've done this. It's now a lot easier for the satellite companies to have on-demand type of channels. Have we also discussed you know, the, the, the possibility of them including something like that uh, on the on the satellite, which which wouldn't cost uh, that much, I don't, wouldn't think. I spoke with the uh, representatives, uh, government relations representatives, last year with regard to this issue, because uh, and this motion hadn't come up yet because we wanted to explore just to see where they stood on it, and their position was they don't have the bandwidth. It comes down to bandwidth and carriage costs, and so the, the issue is really money. You're you're going to have to. Is that and help me understand the technology behind it, because I thought uh, when, on, when you're dealing with the on-demand stuff, you pretty much have unlimited, you know, bandwidth because you're not, you're not using it up until somebody asks for it, right? Well, according to what I was told last year, they are bandwidth maximum capacity all the way across the board. Their spectrum is, is sewn up. But you have to remember that part of that bandwidth is dedicated to commercial channels. We're talking about QVC and those channels. So they were only willing to discuss carriage of, even on a, on a demand basis, carriage of the uh, city's Channel 35 on a cost basis. And quite frankly, the last time we talked with them, it was very expensive, cost prohibitive. Even, I mean, because isn't there must be a huge difference between asking them to have a Channel 35 dedicated channel that they would argue they can't broadcast into a narrow narrow cast versus having a, a you know a screen three levels deep that you click on to get whatever you need I mean you can get Hulu and I mean like you can get anything these days I don't I find it it's strange to me that I keep looking at my satellite TV and seeing more and more and more options that you can click through and layers upon layers of things and it doesn't seem like there's any limit so, so help me understand the well, This limit. is what it came down to from one of the, I won't tell you which one, yeah. from one of the uh, satellite broadcasters. They said, if you have, the city has $50 million, we can launch another satellite and you can have whatever you want. Mm. So, I mean, that was their response to me. And, and maybe I'm not Council Member Blumenfield, but, you know, I did speak for the city of L.A. at the time because I asked, it was a formal request that we were making on behalf of ITA to see where we stood with that. So I, I agree with you that they are, probably is the ability to do that, but you know, whether they're motivated to do it or not, since they've already met their 4% obligation, which they always keep talking about, uh, that's where it stands. All right, well, let's, I mean, I want to move forward on the, we're going to have our questions, of course, but on the, the options that you're putting forward, but um, I know it's not my motion, but I think I could be helpful on this. I, I would love to set up a meeting with, with them and with you, and having someone in the room who understands the technology aspect of it, so it's not me just imagining that it doesn't cost anything, but, but you guys have the wherewithal to say it costs you pennies to, to put up a, you know, a button on your fourth screen that says Channel 35. I mean, 
I, I don't quite, I don't get it why they'd be so hostile if it is so, you know, so inexpensive. Well, I, I don't know the word hostile, I think it's more of a business decision that they've made because once they pick us up, and this is the argument they always make, once they pick us up, us up, then now they've got to take New York. Where do you stop once you get the top 10 cities on their system? And do you stop at the t top 10, 20 cities? This is the argument that we hear all the time, just so you know. You know, I get that. And I guess my, I must be imagining a different way than it really works because I'm, I'm imagining it like a web page mm -hmm. where so what? So you have three layers deep and you list every city on there and you, you know, you have access to all of them, but it doesn't cost you anything unless somebody goes there and actually clicks on it. And then you're getting the eyeballs here. Commercial. Well, here's the beauty of moving through on our recommendation is that they, now they need to address the issue of you're carrying it on one of your systems. Why can't you carry it on the other? Because they're, they're, they're doing that now. They're taking the uplink and they're bringing it down so they can carry, for example, HBO. And if they have our peg channels on there, they could just cut out channel 35, then we, we may be in that, in that. And is that because the U-verse technology is different than yes. satellite? Because U-verse really is the internet, right? Right. And, and satellite is, is not. It's an uplink. We talk about terrestrial and extraterrestrial. And so that's 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 the the bottom line there, you know, uh, is that they're, they're the the technologies are entirely different. The programming isn't, by the way, yeah. and that's what you're looking at, but not not the uh, technology. It's going to be moot soon anyway, because you can just get it off your Apple TV or whatever the equivalent is in five years, and nobody's yeah. going to know how they're getting it. Yeah. Anyway, but right. Any questions? On this? They don't know what they're missing. <laughs> We agree. Well, again, the good thing is we're on AT&T U-verse now. City is, the peg channels are, and that means that you're in all of the contiguous counties to uh, wherever U-verse is to the county of Los Angeles, including the county of Los Angeles, just so you know. Toward Mr. O'Farrell's point, maybe maybe we should send some of our regular uh, speakers who come to council I say it, you know. go to some of these places and let them know what they're missing. <laughs> you know? Uh, <laughs> Maybe we should open council with a, a little floor show and, you know, maybe close it with a little floor show and spice it up a little bit and get some ratings. One further request. Please don't ask ITA to do that for you. <laughs> okay. I, I, I just want to note, I think the, the push behind this, it, I don't know that there's a big demand for this, but the, the push behind this, I think, is, 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 is a noble sentiment to increase transparency. But honestly, the, the most important things we do rarely happen downstairs during the, the, the meetings. The, the kind of things that I think people would be far more interested in us being transparent and informative about are, you know, the the, the coordinating construction projects and, and stuff like that, the development projects that we were talking about earlier, because that has an impact on people's lives. Yeah. And if we're going to focus on transparency, that's where I spend time. Um, Thank you. We certainly agree. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, without objection, we'll move forward on this recommendation. And I'll look forward to working with uh, Stephanie on that to get you together with uh, those uh, representatives of the right. satellite. And, and we should probably coordinate with the offices whose motions this really is, because uh, I don't want to step on their toes either. So, very good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The city Hall falls. <laughs> okay, uh, Mr. Villanueva, Phil item four. Yes, sir. Item number four is the CEO report relative to the First Amendment to the grant agreement with the Los Angeles Cable Television Access Corporation to manage and operate Channel 36. We do not have any uh, speaker cards on this item. Hello. I'm Anastasia Tarpe with the City Administrative Officer. Item before you is a two-year extension through a First Amendment of the First Associated and Amendment Grant Agreement between ITA and the Los Angeles Cable Television Access um, Corporation, LACTAC to operate Channel 36 for an amount of $505,000 per year, or a total amount of $1.01 million um, over the two-year term of the extension. LACTEC is a nonprofit corporation that has operated and managed the city's public educational and government access channel, Channel 36, for the last 17 years. The two-year extension will provide sufficient time for ITA to complete an RFP process. For the 2014-15 fiscal year, which is the first year of the extension, the adopted budget allocates a total of $505,000 for Channel 36, which includes $255,000 in unrestricted funding that LACTEC uses to support their operations and an additional $250,000 that is restricted for capital expenditures, such as for the purchase of equipment. 
All future year funding for this grant agreement is subject to mayor and council approval through the annual budget process. We recommend approval of this to your extension. Um, if you have any questions. What, what are the deliverables the city expects from LACTAC? Um, they have some performance measurements. Good afternoon again, Council Members. William Imperial. I'm the project manager who oversees the uh, grant allocation for, and have been uh, since 2000. I have been since 2006. The uh, performance measurements are that uh, with the change in the law in 2007, LACTAC was asked to take on part of the uh, public um, uh, programming, public access programming, because the city lost its public uh, access center. So we had uh, 15 in the city of Los Angeles. With the uh, state law, the cable operators now provide a 1% gross revenue payment in lieu of running those centers. And uh, Council Member Boney, you went through that with us on staff, so you know what happened there. Uh, uh, the centers were closed down. We get the 1% fee, which approximates $6 million. So LACTAC uh, went from running an educational channel to now running a community educational and uh, public access channel. So they deliver to us at least 10% of public access programming. Their board has a committee that reviews the public access programming that's submitted to them from uh, county and city and other residents of uh, the area for airing on their channel. Also, they do distant learning. About 40% of their programming is distant learning programming that's tied to the local state colleges one of their biggest uh, contracts is with uh, Cal State uh, Dominguez Hills and followed up by Cal State Northridge, then Cal State Long Beach, and Cal State Los Angeles. They also tied to the LA Community Colleges, including uh, LA City College, that do, dis learn do distance learning. They've been quite successful in allowing people that don't have the wherewithal to attend the campus to see the programming on their, on their channel, and they've helped to graduate over 6,000 people in the city in the last uh, 10 years. So, and we've verified that with the, with the schools. So they, their metrics are simply to provide at least 10% of public access programming, 40% of educational um, distant learning or educational programming, and the rest in community uh, um, programming. The community programming is essentially um, at the university level, college level, they do music programs, uh, mariachi festivals, things like that. They used to do um, the programming for the high school football teams, you know, Garfield Roosevelt and all of the rivalries. And they do it to some extent, but Time Warner Cable has picked that up for almost free. So uh, if I were Time Warner Cable in high school, I would say that's a better deal than Black Tech and maybe a two, two or $3,000 charge. So they do continue to do that when they're asked to do so on occasion. And that, those are the metrics that they perform for the city. And the distant, distance learning stuff, I was, when you're doing a class over a cable station, it's not going to be interactive. It's just going to be one way, right? Well, they're, they're required to submit their, uh, my understanding is they're required to submit their documentations and their testing through the Internet. So there is some level of that. And they do have a, a very good on-demand uh, content carriage of their, uh, of their programming on demand as well. I get, I get the need why we, we have it all. The sort of question, if you're going to do distance learning, which is a great thing, and I've been a big advocate for it, uh, you're better off using the Internet for it and having an interactive environment because you're going to be on the Internet anyway. You can't argue that you're using this to give access to people who don't have access to the Internet because you have to have the Internet to take the class anyway. So why not take the whole class through the Internet? Why? Why bother with the extra step of going through TV? Actually, you may be right on that. This may be the, the phase in of the internet for, for that particular use. As you know, the, um, Starbucks just said that they would pay for the education of their, of their workers uh, online through the University of Arizona. So you're, you're basically seeing that happening. We just may be in, the, in that gray phase of the carryover phase where that's going to occur. So we'll just have to let it play out. And this grant's only for two years, so. We'll see where we go with that. I guess we let it play out, and, and just as a, I don't know, a thought, or you know, we should start thinking about how we can 
better utilize that because forty percent of it going to distance learning that's ineffective oh. compared to what's free online. Well, it may it may be that that forty percent is is part uh, part internet and part I need I need to check with them on that, but it has to be you know um, part internet. I know that for sure because I, I had asked the same question: How do you get graded? Yeah. You know, on that, and and how do you keep the grading uh, something that's <laughs> fair and open to all the students? Right, and then why why bother even having the channel if you're going to be using you know, the online network anyway. I guess maybe you could argue that for the 30 percent of people who don't have high-speed access that you can get more of the, you know, the content streamed more easily and then you could do the interactive stuff online. I, I'm, I'm making that up, but that's yeah. probably something. But it's just something to think about for the next couple of years for you guys to work on in terms of uh, coming up with a better use. But, I, but at I this will. point, it's, 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 it's the peg fee. There's nothing, we you know. I would recommend that we move forward with it. I don't see a better alternative, but uh, open to any other well, Mr. Chair, you bring up a, good, a great point, and uh, it'd be interesting to see what the statistics are in terms of uh, the, the remote learning. What percentage is dependent upon cable and what percentage is dependent upon online? Therein might lie a, a, you know, a more direct way forward as well. Right. Any other questions, thoughts? Okay, without objection, we'll move forward on that. Thank you. And uh, item number five, yes, sir. Item number five is a motion by council members Krikorian and Blumenfield relative to the purchase and sale agreement to complete the sale transaction of the abandoned fire station 78. We do not have any speaker cards on this item. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, councilman. Good afternoon. Yeah. Fire Station 78 has been a property we've had since 2008, and we've been authorized by council to do a direct sale. We've thus far completed most of that process, and we are now ready to execute a purchase and sale agreement with the city attorney. All right, any questions that you have on this particular? What are the next steps in the process after we get through this? Well, we'll finish the uh, PSA, and then we'll negotiate with the property owners. We've already had a price that's been agreed upon by the sellers, I'm sorry, the uh, buyers, and we don't foresee any problems with that. At that point, we'll have the uh, ordinance completed, and then the sale will be completed. And when would we close escrow? Possibly in uh, four months. And are there any other big issues that need to be resolved on it? Uh, none that we have encountered so far. Okay. Any, any other thoughts or questions? Good item. So uh, without objection, we'll move forward. That's approved. Thank you very much. Thank you. I believe that's our last item. Mr. Villanueva, any other, anything else on the docket? Nothing, sir. All right, then. This meeting is officially adjourned. Thank you all for being here. So, as